What's going on? It's at CEO and founder of Let Bob. We got an exciting episode coming, man. I was watching the movie Till and I seen Mountain Bio, Mississippi. Never heard of it before, but it's black owned business at its best, man. I ain't going to reveal all the information, all the history. But for Juneteenth, man, I wanted to do something different, a different episode, kind of live in what black owned business is really about and show like what's the power of it when it's executed at its best. So y'all look forward to it. When y'all see what we're doing, I promise you're going to learn something. Again, it's Ant. I'm out. It's just something that I live. It's just something that I live. Hey, 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 it's just something that I live that this world don't live. It's just something that I feel that this world don't feel. I gotta keep it real. J.E. It's just something that I live that this world don't live. It's just something that I feel. Welcome to the Let Bob Podcast. Got an exciting show for you guys today. We got a special guest. Y'all know I'm an old soul, so anytime I get to talk to my wisdom, my wisdom, I get excited. But what's important and what's special about this gentleman, he's in a place that many people who look like us don't even know about. I discovered this location watching the movie Till recently, and I told my team we have to reach out. Let's see, can we find somebody, some people from the area to tell us about the town and tell us about you know, insight that we would not otherwise know about. And this gentleman who we have on the podcast today has some great insight. In fact, he happens to own the Mount Bayou Museum of African-American Culture and History, Mr. Herman Johnson. How are you doing today, Mr. Johnson? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. It's good to be here. Oh, well, I'm so excited to have you on here. So I'm from McCall, Alabama, over here in um in a, a small country rural area and okay. i grew up in more of a village village city you know everybody knew everybody and so um i'm gonna call you mr johnson for the whole interview please you know i can't do anything else i can't call you by the first night my granddad will come out the grave and choke me down so i can't uh, <laughs> well you you have my put you have my permission but if granddad's gonna get you then okay okay right. thank you I'll thank you so much Mickey, but uh <laughs> We don't uh, want to upset granddad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call you Mr. Johnson. Keep him All happy. Right. Him All right. Much grave and give <laughs> but no, um, I had never heard of um, Mountain Bayou, Mississippi. Never heard of it. I watched a movie, Till, mm -hmm. uh, here recently. And um, as you know, being from there was just a tragic story. Um, but uh, 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 a nice... I guess you could say uh, depiction of what it is to be black in America and what it was to be black in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing that the black population and ownership was just so um, extreme in Mount, I, I was really um, adamant about getting you got getting someone from, from the town on here to just give us an insight and tell us about it. So were you born and raised there or did you move there? I was born and raised here. Oh man, so you've seen some things. I've seen some things, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, seeing that you own the museum, uh, was your family always owners in Mount, or how did that come about? How did you get into um, it? Yes, my my uh, great grandparents were part of the original settlers. I have oh. four great grandparents that came up from the uh, from the Vicks, from Vicksburg area, which the original settlers came off a plantation south of Vicksburg called okay. Hurricane and Bridefield. And uh, so I had four, uh, 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 you know, uh, ancestors that were part of that, that, that crew that came up from, from Vicksburg. Yeah. And so my grandfather owned a cotton gin. Oh. And, uh, and, and it's little known fact that let me just say this. Can I just go off for a list one a second? Black people really are not just, just really, really finding out our history. Okay. And um, Mount Bayou was 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 known to have the highest grade of cotton in the world. Oh wow! 
And that's where, uh, and that's that, that's our people who from that plantation, well, let me go back a little bit more because most people, since, since, since you just discovered Mount Bayou, then probably your audience, most of them had never, never heard about the remarkable history of Mount Bayou. Let me say a couple of things, and you can just tell me if you want me to go deeper or not, but I'm gonna just say a couple of things. First of all, the, the, it goes back to the plantation they were on, but down in uh, Vicksburg area. Okay. They were uh, educated on that plantation. They were educated. Matter of fact, the founder of Mount Bayou, his father, Ben Montgomery, was probably one of the most educated men in the state of Mississippi. Uh -huh. um, before, while he was a slave, while he was an enslaved. And then after the Civil War, he bought the plantation that he used to be enslaved on. And then after he bought that plantation, then they developed the highest grade of cotton in the world. Wow. And so from there, when they came to Mount Bayou, when they came up here, then this area, well, he dies and then his son takes over his vision. And his son comes up here and they plotted out an area that was halfway between Memphis and Vicksburg, a hundred miles each way. And this was just wilderness and they were building a railroad through here. And so they bought land from the railroad and established Mount Bayou in the wilderness and then develop again, the highest grade of cotton in the world. <laughs> so this city had more because we had the highest grade of cotton in the world instead of just having one cotton gin like a town of this size probably would have had, well, they had to end up with six because everybody in the other areas around here would bring their cotton here because they got a higher price if they brought it here and got the Mount Bayou label. Wow. And so therefore they ended up having, have, having to have six cotton gins. And because it was uniquely black and created black, then, of course, people who were being mistreated in other areas around North Mississippi would come here to spend their money when they got a chance. So, <laughs> therefore, the people who own businesses here got wealthy. And so that's why in Mount Bayou, you had all of these three and three, two and three story houses with white picket fences around it, that even the president of the country was invited here and he came and stopped. Theodore Roosevelt and called it the jewel of the Delta because he had never seen anything like that. Wow. That's amazing. And, and more importantly, it's never, I'm like, I'm really learning this as you're talking about it. And I'm like, wow, there was black owned cotton. <laughs> there was black owned cotton gins and black owned businesses creating, creating and selling cotton, growing and selling cotton. Like exactly. this is stuff you, you know, you just, generally don't hear you know uh well, i got another question for you i think you were telling me about um someone buying their the plantation that they were on they come back and buy it or something you were telling me I... yeah they the uh the davis plantation um and and let me interject a couple of things in that that plantation was owned by joseph davis his okay. younger brother who was on his same land but not that particular plantation it was Hurricane and Bridefield. The other plantation was owned by Jefferson Davis. Okay. And Jefferson Davis happened to be the president of the Confederacy. Okay. But his brother, elder brother, 23 years his elder, uh, owned the plantation that people from Mount Bayou were on. I mean, from Mount eventually Mount Bayou had been on. And yes, they ended up uh because Benjamin Montgomery who was one of the most educated people, not only on that plantation, but in the state of Mississippi okay. uh, and had been basically running the plantation at the end of the war, the, the Davises sold the plantation to the Montgomery's for $300,000. Wow. Wait and when I look it up, I don't know if you can Google it yourself, but I think at the last time I looked it up, I think it said that that's the equivalent of 10 to $12 million in today's money. Wow. So wait a minute. I got to make sure I'm hearing you right. You're saying that a, a, a freed slave was able to come back and buy the plantation 
For three hundred thousand dollars. For three hundred thousand dollars. Wow. For three hundred thousand dollars, and then become. I mean, he outworked all the other neighbors around him and then become one of the top five planters in the country, in the United States. And what year was this again? In the early or in the mid 1860s. Oh, wow. Oh, OK. That was what I'm talking about. Man, that's black ownership at its best. <laughs> that's black ownership at its best. So Mount Bayou started off that way in ownership even back into the even back to the plantation wow nah man that's unheard of i've never heard um i've never heard any history like that now can i add one more story that you might be interested in sure on that plantation um they were allowed to also run businesses so they owned uh they owned a store on the plantation. So when the steamships came up and down the Mississippi River, which is right next to the plantation, and they wanted to resupply, and they stopped, they and they had a post office in there too. And they wanted to resupply and mail letters. They stopped in the black owned plantation, the black owned store on that plantation while they were enslaved. <laughs> and so of course one of the uh captains of the of steamship protested and they said and 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 you know to the owner of the plantation and told him why you got these black people he said look i buy my stuff from them <laughs> and so he was buying from them too <laughs> no i love that because it shows that black ownership is definitely important but alliances is also still necessary right That's just because Everything is, or we want more black ownership. That doesn't mean we don't want any other culture to own anything. It's just right. how do we operate collectively, right? How do we right. kind of get more of a, a level playing field in the lane of ownership and get an experience like that? Bob stands for black owned business, right? Mm -hmm. Our pillars are education, community, finance, and ownership. And so for us, this is what it's about. But hearing an example of what it looks like. When you have black ownership, you have black people spending their dollar in the black community and make that dollar circulate. To your point, everybody can benefit as a well, culture. The, the example of Mount Bayou would probably be a good example of that because the, the, the money, the money circulated around here more than anywhere else in the in the probably in the state. Wow. Because uh, you know, the, the fact that you in the most racist hostile state in this in the union okay. is mississippi yeah. and so it's very inhospitable and if you go outside of mississippi it's dangerous and so uh, uh i mean i'm sorry go outside of mount bayou was dangerous so yeah. people will come here it was a sanctuary city so if you were in trouble in other parts of the state you end up you end up here but you would all you want to stay here and so money circulated here so yeah. yeah, all those principles of, of business, uh, a lot of those, you know, what we call capitalistic principles of business and that type of thing. If you study Mount Bayou, you will see a lot of those things that were involved here. Now, of course, there was racism from the outside, but yeah, yeah, a lot of things were. You know, I think the the movie Till showed some of that. Right, that's definitely mm -hmm. what got my interest. You know, the only other black community that you know I was versed in is is um. Black Wall Street, um, you know, Tulsa and then somewhat in the Carolinas. But uh, Tulsa was the one that I was 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 very familiar with and that story and what happened and how we were doing there. And so to see another uh, city, I, I'm going to come there, too, because I'm neighboring. I actually wanted to come there to this interview, um, mm -hmm. but I, uh, time didn't allot for it. But I definitely want to come and put my eyes on it. Right. Walk through the the city. You know, I've mm -hmm. never seen something like that in my lifetime in reality, right? Other on, well, there are other cities. There's one in your in your state, Hobson City, Alabama. Really? Yeah, never heard there, of that. There, there's an organization called uh, um, Historical Black Towns and Settlements Alliance. Okay. And if you go to that website, uh, it's hbtsa.org. I okay. think. And you go to that website, and you can see the other cities that are are part of that organization that are drawing together the other black cities in the country. So there's wow. a bunch of them in Oklahoma. Um, 
cancers, I believe. Uh, you know, some of them have died out, you know, and some of them are not really still there. Uh, that's why Mount Bayou is unique because it 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 stayed it stayed in the state that it's in, you know, or in a in a in a in a, an autonomous state for all these years. You know, we we were incorporated in 1887. Okay, and so it's still here. Uh, there, there is, there is a kind of a drought here now, but that's a drought that's really have taken hold of all the Delta towns or all the agricultural type of towns. Yes. So, uh, and, and we're doing a lot now to revitalize this area and revitalize Mount Bayou. And I think, uh, because of the, the civil rights history in this area and also the Emmett Till history, and also the blues is from this area. We're right here in the middle of where the blues was created. Okay. We, we have value that we can utilize to revitalize this whole area and bring tourists from around the world here. And so that's what we are uh, working on now. So what type of businesses are there now? The, the biggest business here in now is the uh, Delta Health Center. Okay, health. Uh, Delta Health Center is a rural health center. It was the first rural health center in the country. Okay. And it was founded here in the late 60s. Uh, it was a big, big deal. That's a whole historical thing by itself because of the fight that they had to, to go through. And it was the fight was national. There were some laws that were changed in Washington because of the fact that we had this, this, uh, this, this rural health center here. But now uh, there are, uh, I think there are 2,500 rural health centers around the country now, but this was the first one. So it's the biggest employer now. Uh, most people that live here work outside of town in other, in maybe in Cleveland or in other places. So, okay. And is that health center, that's black owned or is it a public facility? It's a public facility, uh, but it was started black. black and, um, and the, the, everybody, that you know the, the the people who run it are black, you know, uh, but uh, and they have satellite offices. It's probably the the largest medical organization in the, in the Delta, okay. Because they have other they have other satellite offices around this around the Mississippi Delta, okay. And what's the population there now? Like, how many people are in in Mount Bout? We probably have about 1,500, 1,500 now, and it's mostly black still. It's it's black. We have we ha yeah no we we have we have four white people here. Oh, I can tell you their names. That's what I'm talking about okay. <laughs> they have four white people. I can know exactly where they are right at all times. I keep, <laughs> keep an eye on. No, <laughs> yeah, it's black. It's black. <laughs> That's cool. They hear that, and it's not violence. You're not on the news for killing and shooting and all that good stuff. Oh, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you a good story about that. At the beginning of Mount Bayou, in the early days, in the early 1900s, we had a jail. They built a jail because every town is supposed to have a jail, right? Uh huh. And for 20 years straight, they didn't put anybody in it. There was no okay. crime. And they wow. ended up. They decided after at the end of 20 years, they say, you know, we're not putting anybody in jail. Let's tear the jail down because we need that land. And they tore the jail down. Wow. You know, it's a pretty much uh uh you don't hear about it. No, it's it's we don't we, our skin color is not what makes crime. It's Correct. it's uh you know um it's it's racism that ends up causing crime. But anyway, a lot our of it conditions, uh for yeah, our, conditions. our opinion at Bob financial literacy. Um is a definitely a driver of crime. It's a it's it's a lot, it's definitely not. A, a, a skin tone, right, or a race. Exactly, or and 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 let me tell you one other, one other remarkable fact about this area here, about Mount Bayou. And I grew up here, but because they were educated, the people. And I didn't even get into that story, but they were educated on that plantation, and so once they were free after the war, they were already educated. They came here, and so before there were school districts that the state mandated, there were schools here in Mount Bayou. And so that tradition of education carried on all the way from the plantation, even up until now. The place that I'm in right now is the uh, old man building for the high school, which is closed now. They they consolidated our high school, which was a, which was a huge mistake, but 
they consolidated and sent our high school students to another city, right? But this school district, when it was still a school district, uh, I think seven, seven, eight years ago was when they consolidated. Up until that time, Mount Bayou had was in the top 100 high schools or yeah, had the, one of the top 100 high schools in the country. Wow. Because of the education that was here. There have been studies, uh, thesis, people are written thesis and, and studies on why that there was such an elevated number of children that go on to higher education from this school district, even though this was the only district in the state of Mississippi that did not have 16 session land funding like everybody else. So we had less funding and we had a higher uh, rate of, uh, uh, you know, a higher rate of higher education than any other school in the state. No, I don't find that hard to believe. It actually supports a lot of what I say, you know, um, when the teacher looks like you, they're biased towards you and you're more comfortable in the messaging coming your way. I think that a lot of what we see now is it's everything is generic. And so whoever is creating the generic material is writing or designing that in the bias um, delivery of, of what race or culture they're from. Yeah, that's just natural, right? It's not to say that it's any ill intent there. It's just how it works. Right? right. And so hearing your numbers is actually kind of cool for me because it's like, well, that's what I say. We don't have a, a realistic example of that where I'm from here in Birmingham or um, McCalla. Um, it's not not we don't have the um, I, or I should let me back up. I haven't had the experience where it was black educators only educating from a black curriculum and driving that knowledge through a child's mind all the way up to high right. school. I've never witnessed that. And, and, it, and it wasn't just in here in Mount Bayou, being at a small town. When I was growing up, it was probably about 5,000 people when I was growing up here. But, um, you know, it was more like a village. Everybody yes. taught you. You know, you could not go to the, to the service station where all these old men would be sitting there smoking cigars and telling lies to each other. You couldn't even go there. <laughs> without them quizzing you about your, your you know uh asking you academic questions yeah because this area was that way you know everybody participated in in educating you now that that to your point village mentality uh it, it found in family right and i think that's exactly. a structure for true growth and true innovation it, it must be found in family and so in a village mentality like that it take a collection of families and create one big family and everybody cares right nobody gets left behind by the nature of the structure That's of how right. lifestyle right. is right now you have a uh, difference of opinion and how things are and uh, kind of how the family structure is in our community and i think that's why we see a lot of a lot of challenges we see from a, from academic struggles from violence um from from just what we think family looks like and so, I tend to believe that 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 village structure, uh, without 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 going into the deep education of it, I I I believe that was sort of like what we did in Africa. Oh yeah, village raising the children um, right. mentality, and that that's what we did here in Mount Bayou. Yeah, no, one of my executives is, is Ethiopian, and, and she definitely tells us some stories about how it works over there, and okay, and even how her family. Um, do things here in, in the states um it's that that village approach to it and in talking to her and learning more about it, i realized that's how i grew up you know everybody knew everybody you didn't right. nobody in the community didn't know who stayed in two houses down or exactly. if i was outside being bad you better believe my grandma my auntie my mom my dad got a phone call and you know things were uh addressed so that's 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 I, it I'm that's really that right village here. mentality too so uh, one last question for you. So this, is the, I had this question: Were you, were you or any of your uh, family in the movie in the uh, Till movie? Did they, did they allow anybody anybody from the community to participate in the movie? No, I don't. You know the Till movie. Um, I don't know where they shot that movie. Um, okay, not, I thought I would have thought they would have definitely come there and shot some portions of the movie, so they didn't shoot. Know, 
any of it I, there. I, I'm, having, I'm, having, I'm having a brain freeze right now. I know they shot the the women of the movement. You know, are you familiar with that? Was a Jay Z Will Smith uh, production. That movie was shot in Greenwood. That was shot here in, okay. in Mississippi. The okay. Till movie, I don't remember, but I was just the 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 the, the producer of that movie. Um, the, the guy who spent 29 years putting that movie together. Okay. Um, is is we? I just I was just with him um, Friday. Oh. Um, but he is going to come back here to do another movie. Oh. And cool. do it on T R M Howard. Cool. And T R M Howard to us T R M Howard because I call him. In in when I'm in the in the uh, museum and I'm giving tours, I always called him the Godfather of the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> because he touched so many people. He he mentored he mentored Fannie Lou Hamer, which is in Ruville down the street. Uh he mentored Mega Evers, would who, who worked for him. He also he went over to Montgomery and during the Emmett Till situation, he spoke at MLK's church. And he was the one that influenced Rosa Parks to sit down on the bus after she heard him at, at on that at that speech. He wow. also he also mentored uh, Jesse Jackson. He a actually started Jesse Jackson's uh, Operation Push and Rainbow Coalition in his house when he went to uh, Chicago. And so Amzie Moore, who uh, boycotted the gas stations here. So yeah, this guy had a, a, a big influence. So uh, the guy that wrote the Teal movie wants to do a movie on T.R.M. Howard. Wow. And, uh, yeah, that's yeah. his next project. That, uh, Mr. Howard, is what kind of caught my attention because what he was doing in the movie. And so that's how I started yeah. down the path of finding you guys. You know, I saw it when they shot it there. Or when they said in the movie where they were, I saw that. But what caught my interest is what he was doing. And so I, yeah. went, I went and started researching, like, hey, did this guy really do this stuff? And so that's how I was. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, my, yeah. My my father's first job out of out of college was working for T.R. Howard. Okay. That's that's cool, that's, that's really the reason that I, I'm I'm in, in in I was born here because of T R M Howard. Ah, that's cool stuff. <laughs> ah. So uh, yeah, and yeah, he did that. He did all of that plus more that they don't talk about. That's why uh, Beauchamp believed that he needs to do a more exhaustive movie on T on T R M Howard because people don't know about him. Correct. And his influence. Uh, you know, he, T.R. Howard, let me just tell you a couple of notes. I don't know if you researched this or not, but he started, he, he fell out with the people at Tavorian Hospital. So he went across the street and built Friendship Clinic. Well, next to Friendship Clinic, he built a uh, uh, an inn called Green Parrot Inn. He had a parrot at the door. <laughs> That's why he called it the Green Parrot Inn. And next to that, he built the first Olympic sized swimming pool for black people in the state of Mississippi. Wow. And then next to it, he built a zoo, <laughs> which may be the first zoo in the state. I don't know. Don't don't quote me on that. But uh, <laughs> he built a zoo here in Mount Bayou. And uh, so there's a lot of things that happened here in Mount Bayou that that was normal to me growing up, but abnormal to everybody else. And, and, and I'm looking back at it and I say, yeah, you know, that was kind of crazy. <laughs> he built a zoo. <laughs> But oh, you know, cool. I could walk across the street to the zoo, so you know. <laughs> nah, that's good stuff. Nah, this no, oh, no, nah, this this type of history is so important, um, because of just where the culture is right now. Like really, hearing stories that creates a level of hope that that shows ownership is possible and what it can look like when it's happening for our people. Mm -hmm. um, I think hearing historical statistics to support the statement of how important ownership is. Like you said, he didn't agree with what this hospital was doing, so he had ownership in his back pocket so he could go build his own. <laughs> you know, exactly. and so this is how um, I think um, we can really uh, address um, social change and, and really close this financial wealth gap by pushing ownership on the culture. But unfortunately, as much as I'm loving talking to you, uh, my team, they cut me short on my, my podcast today. They're trying to, we're doing a, a, a Juneteenth um, special. 
And so we're having to kind of keep our podcast short so we can kind of merge and have a, a, a nice um, expression on Juneteenth to promote history like yourself and, and Mount yeah. Out. Just show people things that you just wouldn't normally know or see if you didn't go looking. Um, I can't make a promise, though. I'm going to come there. I'm going to come visit there um, and, and really want to see the town and come to the museum, of course, and meet you in person. Um, and just Absolutely. hang. We we'll love it. We we'll love it. Yeah. Well, my team will make sure we let let you know we're coming um, and make sure we pick times that that um, accommodates your schedule so we can spend some time with you. But I really would like to say thank you for coming on and, and sharing um, history about about your city and your town and what you're doing um, on today. Um, are they able to find you? Do you have any social media like Instagram or Facebook or anything like that? Uh, go to mildbuyermuseum.com. Okay, perfect. And uh, I couldn't tell you. I know. I know we have Facebook page, but I'm not the social media type of person. We have people working on that, and I'm not the guy. So <laughs> I do know like mildbuyermuseum.com. <laughs> you like me? That's how I am. I, 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 my team make me do social media, so I have to know it. Right. They make me do it, so I have to know it. But <laughs> I, I, I limit it. I limit it. But it's been another great episode of Let Bob Podcast. We thank Mr. Herman Johnson for coming on and telling us about the great city of Mount Bao. Um, as you always know, you can find us on all social media at We Are Let Bob. You can find myself at I Am Let Bob. And it's just we're some out. that I live that this word don't live. It's just some that I feel that this word don't feel. I gotta keep it real.